Uh, this is the first of what we hope will be a number of public lectures uh, hosted by the Tocqueville Forum on Liberal Democracy. As many of you know, um, the money we're getting to do this is largely through the generosity of the Jack Miller Center in Philadelphia. So you'll have surveys. We need those for the organization. Please fill them out. Please fill them out completely and honestly. I will thank you. You can give them to me afterwards or on that corner of the bar, whatever, but just make sure I get them. So we're very happy today for our inaugural lecture to welcome Mr. Richard Reinch. Mr. Reinch is the founding editor of Liberty Fund's online journal, Law and Liberty. He also hosts the podcast show, Liberty Law Talk, which features interviews with academics and writers in law and political thought. He is the co-author with Peter Lawler of A Constitution in Full, The Unwritten Foundation of American Liberty from the University of Press of Kansas. He is the author of Whitaker Chambers, The Spirit of a Counter-Revolutionary from ISI Books. And he's the editor of Seeking the Truth and Arrestus Brown's an Anthology from CUA Press. Mr. Reinch's writings have appeared in Perspectives on Political Science, National Affairs, Washington Examiner, American Affairs, The American Conservative, Modern Age, National Review, and the University Bookman. He received his law degree in 2004 from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and practiced law in securities and mergers and acquisitions until arriving at Liberty Fund in 2007. He's here today to give us a talk titled, Arrestus Brownson's Unwritten Constitution. Mr. Reinch. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation uh, to be here, in particular, Professor Burns. Thank you for uh, extending it to me as well. Uh, I appreciate that. It's great to be at an institution that takes seriously Catholicism and the life of the mind and liberal learning and bringing all of those together uh, and understanding how they cohere. That, that's wonderful. So uh, I've heard a lot about Christendom College, and it's been great. I got here a few hours ago, and uh, I've enjoyed walking around and seeing your institution. I'll talk a bit uh, about Arrestus Bronson today, his major ideas. Uh, you have uh, an essay of his on religious freedom uh, from 1864. I'm going to talk about his most political thought, which is found in his book, The American Republic, which was published in 1865. It's obviously the end of the Civil War, a war that will cost him two sons, uh, which uh, I, you know, he had eight children, and agony, of course, over the loss of his two sons, and puts together this book to try and make sense of our constitutional order and our country that had come undone uh, in grievous ways, and could it be mended together? How would it be mended together? And so he's trying to put forward a basis for that. But he does so um, as a Roman Catholic, and he does so as someone who is walking and reading and studying and learning the full Western tradition but thinking theology, philosophy, and political thought together and bringing them to bear in the American constitutional order. So I'll discuss that. I also want to situate him within our contemporary problems, uh, contemporary challenges to American constitutionalism, uh, which are legion, uh, uh, as you guys know. But I'll discuss some of those and then bring in Bronson to see, does he give us resources? for thinking about uh, these challenges and how we might uh, defend and articulate American constitutionalism in ways that differ from standard defenses of constitutionalism that you might find in the Lockean liberal tradition exclusively uh, or in, uh, uh, you know, say, a, a progressive understanding of American constitutionalism. Those seem to be the two competing elements right now. But Bronson, I think, offers us a third. Uh, and it's one that we should know. Bronson, I think, is unjustly neglected. Peter Lawler would say he unjustly neglected Bronson. And that is indeed unfortunate. I think he's one of uh, the best Catholic thinkers and writers America has ever produced. John Courtney Murray, you could argue, maybe it would be a, a second, or maybe would put best Bronson. But they're both significant uh, thinkers and contributors. Full Machine, obviously, on a popular level, uh, does amazing things. But these men, as men of ideas, are people we should know, I think. So in thinking about the challenges American constitutionalism faces, one is obviously, I think, progressivism. And progressivism, which has been going on now for over a century, poses challenges to, I think, foundational ideas of our Constitution, to separation of powers, to federalism, to the deliberative 
form of government that our Constitution, I think, is largely predicated on. And the place of those, right, it offers a wide-ranging executive power. In the place of deliberation, it offers a administrative decrees, uh, judicial power, judicial rights, all right, a science, a bureaucratic administration that will deliver to us uh, the appropriate public policy for the time, but of course that will change as we progress forward. Um, and so these are all needed to achieve equality, egalitarianism, social justice, uh, and a range of policy reforms. And of course, the latter day descendants or progressives that we deal with also now tell us that things like abortion, uh, same-sex marriage, pornography, and a various collection of autonomistic rights um, are, are what the Constitution is about. And these are willed into being, not through deliberation, not through lawmaking necessarily, uh, but through judicial order or through executive order, through executive decrees. We also have this same group increasingly downplay traditional rights, traditional protections that are actually in the Constitution, like religious freedom, like freedom of speech increasingly, um, and freedom of association and moving away from that as something necessary to a free society. But of course, even the, new, the challenges keep coming. And so we've had a new one uh, recently, which is now royally higher education. I imagine probably not Christendom. Uh, public education throughout our schools, uh, journalism, sports, uh, NASCAR even, uh, and that is identity politics. And I, I think uh, this has been going on now. I think it started uh, left campus maybe a decade ago, sort of high pitch identity politics but was really coherently stated in the 1619 Project. I think that's its foundational basis. In the 1619 Project, Fourth rightly holds that our country is not just ill-founded, that's the progressive community, but that this country is baked in the racist desecration of blacks. Quote, anti-black racism runs in the very DNA of this country, end quote. The 1619 Project states that American independence was made possible, was formed to protect and deepen the institution of slavery. And what's the culmination of all of this? The legacy of slavery and racism are so firmly grounded into our Constitution, our laws, our institutions, and culture that it will take nothing less than a massive encroaching effort by the federal government to eliminate racism from American life. But now we also have conservative thinkers, uh, post-liberal thinkers, you might say, who blame not progressivism or modern ideological errors uh, for our plight, but they blame the Constitution itself. And according to this group, consisting mostly of Catholic intellectuals, some Protestants, uh, the American founding is just a set of interchangeable Hobbesian, Lockean ideas that invited an emancipated individualism, a militant secularism, that emerge over time, an economically exploitative, exploitative order, and all of this has now grown rotten and is falling apart in front of us. And the only reason why things remain so good for so long was America's religiosity, which is now obviously decreasing, and thus the individualism licensed by the Constitution is running amok. And so the Catholic thinker and writer, Robert Riley, refers to this as the poison pill thesis in his new book, America on Trial, most recently published. Uh, one of the most prolific and eloquent academic expanders of this idea is Patrick Deneen, a political science professor at Notre Dame, author of the widely acclaimed Why Liberalism Failed. And I'll note my agreement here with Patrick Deneen. Uh, I consider him a friend. His criticisms of contemporary culture are ones that I largely agree with. His thoughts on higher education I largely agree with. And I, I like the way he brings, uh, I, I think, the full Catholic tradition into a lot of his critiques. But I do disagree with him on when it comes to our country and the founding and the Constitution. I'm going to note that as a way to segue into Bronze. Okay. So Deneen argues uh, that the founding was really built on a relativist philosophy. So he inquired, quote, if we are to believe that the American founding represents the culmination of 
a long and unbroken tradition that stretches back to Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, and Aquinas, then how did that tradition disintegrate so quickly? End quote. Patrick Deneen knows that our founders did not build a constitution ex nihilo, but rather with all of the political and cultural materials they had in hand. He believed that those materials were shot and have given us a deformed political order. So in a 2017 First Things essay, Deneen asserts, quote, we have today more of the country that springs from our political DNA than one that does not, end quote. And that DNA is the autonomy of self, long obscured, which was long obscured by the fact that Americans had a rich and sustaining Christian culture that was older and deeper than the political structure. But that political order has made that culture conform to its liberal anti-culture. As Robert Riley notes, quote, Deneen does not speak of the betrayal of our political origins, but the fulfillment of their logic. And this logic makes it difficult to be both a good man and a good citizen of America. As Deneen puts it, Americans will have to break with America and seek to refound the nation on better truths, which are far better than our philosophy and increasingly better than ourselves." End quote. Deneen's argument, I would just note, along with any others, is short on what those replacement truths better are. But I want to ask a different question. Should we not actually seek to save, to conserve the American family? Now, in response to such a question, Deneen might refer us to the great Czech anti-communist writer and statesman Václav Havel, who he says, quote, did not appeal to the better version of the communist regime of Czechoslovakia or seek to reform it from within, but to expose its unstable foundations by refusing to pretend that its lies were true. End quote. This is in response to a question uh, he had received about defending America. Deneen must see himself as a Havel like truth teller, exposing the lie of American constitutionalism. But one way to think about this, maybe, is to play out uh, sort of the duel in the 90s and <coughs> in the early decade, first decade of this century, between two justices of the Supreme Court, two Catholic justices of the Supreme Court, Anthony Kennedy and Antonin Scalia. So, Scalia, so Kennedy famously asserts in the mystery passage uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that at the heart of liberty for every American is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. In the world. This is really constitutional gospel, not just for Kennedy, I would argue, but for Denis. Justice Scalia referred to this as, quote, the sweet mystery of life passage, mocking its postmodern ridiculousness. But I think if Scalia could have held conversations with the sage of South Bend, he could have learned how rotten his constitution really is and how correct Justice Kennedy was. But we should ask, what, if anything, are we grateful for as American conservatives? Ask differently. What exactly do we not want to become and walk? And that implies an inheritance, something given, not made. Maintain, yes. Develop, yes. But a gift that we as Americans have received, and that should mean that our country, its animating ideas, history, memories, and the membership we have as its citizens are precisely the goods that we are trying to conserve. So as you think about Patrick Deneen's argument, ask yourself where precisely America and those who want to conserve America fit in to it. But you know, I think the ultimate reason uh, for the appeal of Deneen's book uh, is it really puts the question, right? Should the American constitutional regime continue to exist? Like progressives of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, he is doubtful that it should. But where those early progressives were giddy over the prospect of making us into a new country, 
the name seems largely resigned to the fate of our liberalism. Many conservatives feel the same in the wake of the foundational challenges to marriage and religion, and in the face of what seems to be the ongoing desire to drown out our public voices with a megaphone of identity politics. So when Deneen states that, quote, the fabric of beliefs that gave rise to the nearly 250-year-old American constitutional experience may be nearing an end, he increasingly carries thoughtful religious conservatives especially some of the younger voices with them, and I understand that. And so I'm uh, putting that forward today. But what if there was one American thinker whose biography and writing on politics, religion, and philosophy perfectly expressed the errors of modernity, the progressives, critical race theories, not so much, but, and, and, the need, and, and the thing that the need identifies for us, but whose intellectual also found its way to articulating a completely opposite understanding of these same subjects. That is, his mature ideas defend the American founding, the Constitution, and our liberal tradition, properly understood, not as a pitch, and not as a pitch-perfect expression of natural rights and merely enlightenment political thinking. Rather, the neglected 19th century Yankee, Roman Catholic convert, and conservative Orestes Bronson defends the Constitution as a political achievement, one that is full of compromises. What else could it be, given those who were coming together and their different interests? Built on a particular history, law, theology broadly conceived, and all the civilizational materials that our founders had to work with. And it is Bronson's writings that ultimately argued that it is Christian model theory and a biblical worldview that provides ultimately the best seedbed for Republican constitutionalism and its accompanying doctrines of equality and liberty under law. Bronson's defense of his country never ignored the seeds of destruction that are present in the family. But he thought that while Lockean liberalism was there and could lead to a diminution of Republican spiritedness and politics, there was ample authority in the founding to hedge against that dismal future, to appeal to against it. So as my co-author, Constitution and Full, the late Peter Lawler noted on many occasions, there was a lockbox where we could keep lock in it on this, on this more soon. So just to think about Bronson, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote his master's thesis at Harvard on Bronson. You know, Arthur Schlesinger, in his scholarship, popular writing, always looking for antecedents of progressive thinking further back than the early 20th century, so he finds them in Andrew Jackson. He also thinks rightly, I think, he sees them in Orestes Bronson, who in the 20s, 1820s and 1830s, writes as a Protestant liberation theologian. He's a minister in different denominations. He's a Unitarian for a while. He's an atheist for a while. And he is thinking about Christianity largely in terms of social reform. Uh, particularly in Boston, uh, where he has a church. Uh, he is, you know, for a while located in New York. Um, he, he spends time as a young man in what's called the Burned Over District uh, of upstate New York, uh, New Joseph Smith. Uh, so religion ideas fervor are, are just a part of his experience in his mind as an American. So he's, he anticipates Karl Marx in some of his writings. Uh, he has millenarian notions of democracy and equality, and he embraces the French thinker Auguste Comte's scientific humanitarianism early in his career. Uh, Comte, of course, wants to ape the Catholic Church with the humanitarian church that will sort of point man, humanity, you know, forward. Um, uh, so in the Brazil's flag, uh, as, as this motto, it's a Comte motto, order and progress to this day on the flag. Um, so he's arguing in this period, it's a combination of humanitarianism, science, democracy run amok, egalitarianism. Consider this address that he gives in 1834 uh, in Dedham, Dedham, Massachusetts. This is what he says to a public gathering on the Declaration of Independence. We have come together to celebrate freedom's birthday. Not the birthday of freedom, 
merely for this country, but for the world, for man universally. There was a deeper meaning in the Declaration of the Congress of 76, to which we have just listened, than that of the political independence of this country, a higher and holier triumph than that of ours, or even that of the political independence of any country excites the warm emotions of our hearts and calls forth our sympathy. We celebrate the triumph of humanity. No limited horizon confines us today. A boundless heaven spreads out over us, and the whole human race comes within the scope of our vision. This is what he thinks the Declaration of Independence is pointing to. So, Bronson calls for social equality as the full realization of the political equality of citizens. The Declaration is an aspirational document uh, pointing, us, uh, pointing us to equality. And he says, we want laws which shall not only speak the same language to all, but which shall have the same meaning for all, the same practical effect upon all inquiry. So think about that. That's, we actually know that language pretty well now. Think about contemporary progressive arguments. Uh, it's not enough really to have property rights. It's not enough really to have free speech or the right to vote. The government must do a number of things for you if you're to actually exercise those rights, right? Health care should be a constitutional right. Uh, you shouldn't have to be saddled with responsibilities of registering to vote or proving your identity or anything like that. You just show up and vote. Uh, right, and, and so that's this notion of the laws should equally affect us all in the exact same consequence. What does that do for liberty? Similarly, think about this idea of equality of outcome, right, equality of results. Um, think about, right, this, the 1619 critical race theory. Any difference between races on any outcome is just racism. There's no other competing explanation. This sort of comes out of this thinking. Bronson also writes in 1840, and this is, you know, Bronson is a major public figure, he's the court uh, philosopher of the Democratic Party. There's an election in 1840, a presidential election, significant, uh, I think it's a significant presidential election in our history and what it seems to be suggesting about presidential politics. Bronson's candidate loses. Um, and he learns a lot from this election, this essay that he writes before it called The Laboring Classes. It's something of an agrarian socialist manifesto, talking about uniting labor and capital in the same hands. And he is pilloried in the press for writing this essay, and it's used against his own party. But what Bronson gathers uh, from this election, it's sort of, when well, he thinks about, so you know, this is uh, William Henry Harrison wins, right? This is the law cabinet and hard cider uh, propaganda appeals. And what he begins to see is that democracy and equality, in a real way, don't necessarily make good outcomes. Um, putting your hopes in popular politics, putting these sorts of millenarian expectations, don't exactly uh, work. Uh, they feed into uh, uh, things you're not going to like, necessarily. And so he loses his job. He has a patronage job, uh, a good job. He begins to rethink his political approach. He's also theologically becoming, I, I would think, orthodox um, and sort of leaving behind uh, liberation theology and starting to understand, he writes an essay called The Freedom of God. And so he starts to think of God as a person and as someone uh, not utterly transcendent, but a God concerned and loving and communing, what a God that we can't participate in uh, with our prayers. And this starts to have a dramatic effect on his thinking. And so Bronson goes through this period, and it's sort of, if you've read Eric Vogelin, and Eric Vogelin talks about the ideologue coming to terms with highly resistant reality, with human nature, resisting whatever perfectionist calls are out there, uh, or, you know, say, a socialist ideology. And what are you going to do? when things don't work anymore, when it doesn't seem like your ideology is cashing out. And so, you know, if you think about it, one response is to double down on the ideology, right? Uh, the workers don't join in the revolution. Well, it's because they have false consciousness. They don't know they're oppressed. And so you redouble your appeals. Well, Bronson moves in a different direction. By 1844, he's converted 
to Catholicism. He's rethinking his education, which consists of reading the common law, reading Aristotle's politics, reading Thomas Aquinas. And he starts to appreciate American Republican constitutionalism. He was, as we might say, uh, mugged by reality uh, in these sets of experiences. And so we would say he starts to move to the right. And he starts to give this defense of constitutionalism. He also sees modern philosophy as a gigantic problem, isolating people uh, within sort of the prison of self. He you know, thinks Descartes, he thinks Kant, uh, these thinkers are a problem. Uh, they preempt knowledge of the objective world. They preempt knowledge of nature. Bronson says man is incomplete without the reality of an intelligible world that exists apart from his subjective world. The political consequences for this realist shift in his thinking lead him to come to terms with man's Ill, inbuilt uh, capacity for politics, his rational capacity to reason and speak about the good. And it's these limitations and these capacities that point to the possibility of, of political unity of a mediated politics that can be achieved under law, which supports human flourishing. And so, as I mentioned at the outset, the most compelling evidence we have of Bronson's affirmation of Republican government is in the 1865 work, The American Republic, Its Constitution, Tendencies, and Destiny. In that book, he confirms the natural rights conclusions of the Declaration but not an enlightenment methodology in reaching those conclusions. Bronson affirmed the equality of human persons as a fact, but one that has become evident through Christian revelation, which the philosophers cannot help but now affirm. Human beings are equal because they are equally created, not because they are created equal. Our equality is real because we all stand under God, and that means no man can rule enough another. So government itself is a trust relationship, a public trust relationship that the government holds on authority both to God and to the constituted people. Now this shift, Bronson says, undermines a key aspect of social contract thinking, potentially evident in the Declaration, and that is self-sovereignty as the origin of government. So his rejection of social contract thinking is about the fact he thinks it points or that it lacks an external referent uh, higher than man's will. And it, it doesn't point to anything other than us. And that means how are you ultimately going to limit and shape government? But the problem for America is that the social contract thinking really was the most consistent teaching among the founders for explaining their act of independence in forging the Constitution. America accepted the theory, quote, the state is held to be a voluntary association of individuals. Individuals create civil society and may uncreate it when they judge advisable. So as noted earlier, the founders justified their independence from Great Britain using social contract thinking in part. But this fact must be understood in light of the statesmanlike compromises they made to secure political unity. And it's those compromises that, from Bronson's view, made what they built better than they knew, insofar as they incorporated the political, religious, familial, and other relational dimensions of the human person that were slighted, that are slighted by liberal individualism. So Locke's contract theory is one part of the beginning. But the material that the fathers and we as Americans build with are much more than consent, self-interest, and individualism. And Bronson articulates these ideas. I'm going to talk about the territorial democracy, the unwritten or providential constitution, and his observation that religious freedom in America is ultimately freedom of the church, which must be balanced against the ways that democracy and equality might wear down liberty and excellence and also virtue and political leadership. So territorial democracy, if you think about it, um, it's a notion law and public authority are tied 
to a sphere of enclosed land and to a politically constituted people. And so what's he, he juxtaposing that against? The, the idea of a social contract that we are all in nature and somehow either out of fear or to protect property and body, we come to an agreement and we sign a contract. And so it's, you know, it's really tied to the individual. Ross is saying, no, it's tied to this group of people who have a history and a tradition they are the ones who form a written constitution. We're capable of political unity, but only if we agree on a foundational law which must run with the land and be seen as legitimate in the eyes of citizens. This is to say that law, borders, and the nation stand higher in a regime than various ideologies, rivalries, and identities. Our constitution okay, governs our land is the object of our trust and obedience. So territorial democracy is also Bronson's way of expressing the irreducibly Republican dimension of every free political order. Political loyalty pertains to the way of life shared by a particular people uh, occupying a particular part of the world. Now, consider the idea of natural rights as so many contemporary advocates contend makes the very idea of legal borders seem unjust. Free individuals should be open uh, to make contracts directly with each other in an unmediated marketplace, global marketplace, freed up from the rent seeking of political force and fraud. But the truth, Bronson would say, is that we are embodied beings who find ourselves at home in particular places, and that natural rights to become effective have to be secured by a particular order. And this means that political order is about justice, Bronson says, understood as a good shared in common, as opposed to the selfish loyalties demanded by tribes, tyrants, majorities, and dislocated individuals. So territorial democracy is integral, integral to American self-understanding and its habits of government because it distinguishes the Republican form of government from modern political tendencies that claim to exemplify republicanism, but are a slow return to barbaric political forms. And there, when he's, he's talking about two tendencies of modernity, collectivism and individualism. Why do, we, why do we see modern democratic regimes kind of go in those two directions? Or to be unable to think about a middle term. Rawson thinks that's the point of territorial democracy. So it is not, to ongoing redefinition by majorities, nor is it just contractual consent. It is to say that territorial democracy realizes uh, what the regime is, what makes it, what forms it, and that becomes a way to think about how we should be political in this constitutional regime. America is interesting because we are, he says, United States. United States, sovereign only within the territory or domain of the United States. And their sovereignty, the United States, is a state because fixed, attached, or limited to that specific territory. It is fixed to the soil, not nomadic. So Bronson has sort of a solidarity idea here. America can only be understood not as a consolidated government, but as United States. But that also means those United States have their own sphere of responsibility and representation that accords to the particular order they are in. So you can't understand America without the United States, but you also can't understand America as purely consolidated. This is his argument with the secessions. On one level, he thinks secession talk is a part of American political theory, but he says it's also wrong in the sense that this nation has to be understood as united. It's been united from its beginning. They instinctively unite the colonies to fight. They seek uh, emancipation from Great Britain together and, uh, and move forward in that way. That's the secession is to ultimately break the faith with that constitutional understanding. So my time is running out close. Okay. So let me move on and then just I want to get in the providential constitution. Um, we have a written constitution, that's something new, uh, at least at the time. 
But Bronson argues that legitimacy, the legitimacy of the written doctrine, why would we just write things down? What's the significance of that? It hinges, its legitimacy hinges on the unwritten or the providential constitution. Now, providential isn't necessarily referring to uh, the role of divine providence as we can just identify things uh, that make America, America as decreed and positive revelation of God. But it is a reflection on the full inheritance that American statesmen of the founding had to work with. Providence is to be guided by custom, tradition, and prior political experience. Quote, there must be for every state or nation a constitution anterior to the constitution, which the nation gives itself, and from which the one it gives itself derives all its vitality and legal force. So, Law and I argued in the Constitution in full, I'm trying to put flesh in this idea. This unwritten Constitution is found in a people's political culture, mores, customs, disposition, and peculiar talents. The authoritative law of a particular country can't be viewed apart from the context of the unwritten Constitution. No government built to stand the test of time can be a merely willful construction that defies the historical spiritual and cultural materials that have shaped and formed people in quote. So the elements of our unwritten order, uh, our common law heritage, a lot comes out of that in the way we uh, associate private rights and private law. The colonist practice of self-government, right? We have 150 years of self-governing colonies prior to independence. Widespread biblical knowledge and religious practice political pluralism, and the colonies as unified actors in their bid for independence. So providential constitutionalism means bringing together in one comprehensive self-understanding the partial truth of all the understandings of human freedom that have been discovered in the history of the West. If you think of the American family as pulling together and I think you know, there's a reason why Russell Kirk, the conservative thinker, loved Bronson. Right? Both were on this wavelength of the cities, of Jerusalem, of Athens, of Rome. Um, you might say for America, also the Scottish Enlightenment, so Edinburgh. Um, all of these ideas find a way in the American founding. If we look even at the own writings, what are our founders and what are our framers referencing for explaining what they're doing? So for taking responsibility for the American Republic, we also think about the real, free, and relational person. How else do you understand the state governments have, who are given by the central power in the Constitution tremendous governing authority, particularly over morals and religion? And so the real relational person, we would argue, is the real way to think about the American citizen. And this real relational person comes with economic, familial, political, and religious dimensions to his being. This is more differentiated than the ideological depictions of individuals who understand themselves either as a part of some social or political order or as sovereigns or self-sufficient individuals who proclaim their rights at the expense of any obligations they might owe to others around them. So the privilege of liberty can't be divorced from relational responsibilities because no individual flourishing occurs outside of that context. All right. Um, so what does this mean? All right. Um, on one level, to be a constitutional citizen and creature in America isn't a narrow ideological enterprise. But what it does into is finding a way to accord proper authority to the state and proper liberty to the person so that each can realize particular responsibilities. An insistence on liberty does not entail an antipathy for government. Government, Bronson argues, is called for by human nature. It exists naturally. It is good. He's Thomistic, Aristotelian on this point. Um, it is shaped by us living together, our common life together, and with due regard for liberties, economic liberties, social and relational lives that contribute to our development. The state protects these. 
It doesn't create them. It doesn't authorize them, but it is called to protect them. And if it doesn't, it can destroy, uh, can destroy human nature. So America stands, for instance, as under God. Liberty with law and law with liberty are only possible, God also says, if religious freedom is not only recognized, but there must also be a desire by citizens to situate themselves under God and heed the biblical tradition. So our good fortune is that religious exercise was written into the Constitution and in time uh, was acknowledged by most state constitutions. Some state constitutions had state churches. They were actually pretty weak. Um, but this meant for the Catholic convert, Bronson, that the most anti-papal people on earth lived under a constitution that provided the most freedom the Catholic Church had experienced in its history here in this country. This freedom wasn't just individual freedom or religious conscience. It was freedom of the church to teach and organize and proclaim its truth to the world. So I think you know maybe some contemporary uh, things going on here. One of the elitist view of liberty, and think about what Bronson is saying about liberty. The elitist view uh, increasingly detaches detaches us from constraints, biological nature, of civic prejudice, as it views its term way of think, um, and says that our framers actually had this in mind. We would just become progressively freer individuals. This is Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence, uh, starting, you know, starting with Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, but these days, we have reasons to fear that the future planned by our visionaries will not be in any politically recognizable sense constitutional because it's so exclusively individualistic. So just as progressivism, in one sense, comes to an end, uh, in, in the sense in which it was defined by Wilson, FDR, and LBJ, we are now in the thrall of an unbounded and potentially boundlessly manipulatable progressivism based on the detachment of individuals from all relational and other national ties, even our bodies are up for grabs. So libertarians follow Justice Kennedy with this idea of liberty, of an expansive individualism. It has become more true over time. This seed in our family that Bronson thought we could hedge against seems prominent now. Other times in American history, that has not been the case. And there are reasons why it's prominent now. Uh, decisions that have been made in our politics. But the natural tendency of providential constitutionalism is both to look back to our history, what has been good about American constitutionalism and American liberty, to recover those resources and bring them forward, and also to insist on the deliberative republic. That is a way to seek compromises, not judicial decisions, which are always all or nothing, not executive orders, which roil all of this because it comes down to a pin. Uh, and not different groups interacting with them. So the providential constitution insists on deliberations and compromise that will in time, I think, produce truths better than either party intends. Now, one of the things, just to give you an example, um, and this was something Lawler noted, a French priest who came to America in the 50s and spent time doing scholarship here uncovered this. If you think about the Declaration of Independence, uh, Thomas Jefferson writes the first draft, right? But it goes, and there's a committee of five, and then it goes under consideration the full uh, Second Continental Congress. And Jefferson's document, as you would imagine, is purely Enlightenment natural rights thinking. What do, the, what do they do in this sort of deliberation that I'm talking about? They add references to a personal God, to a providential God. If you read it all the way through, that's what you find at the end. Who do they appeal to? To the, the justice and, uh, of their cause, and who do they declare uh, their fortunes to, right? It's to God. So that's one way of thinking about compromise, producing solutions, producing ways, things that we can all live with. Natural rights, we have the God of the philosophers in the Declaration. We also have reformed members of the Continental Congress putting in their conception of, of independence uh, in the document. Um, if we think about the Bill of Rights, 
and you think about we good. If you think about James Madison introducing the Bill of Rights in the first Congress, and that comes out of the insistence in Philadelphia, but also in the state of ratifying conventions uh, for some sort of Bill of Rights um, as a protection, and not actually trusting that the Constitution would work as a plan with regard to express or delegated powers to the federal government. And Madison introduces it. And one of the things, if you go back and read the debates over the Bill of Rights, it's pretty short, given the momentousness of what they're doing, and given how important the Bill of Rights have become to us, and in particular, the First Amendment, the discussion uh, isn't really there. And the religion clauses, there is not much discussion. And what might we make of that? Well, uh, Stephen Smith, uh, originalist, uh, conservative law professor, uh, has said maybe what we should uh, make of that is that there was a consensus going on there. So there wasn't that much to talk about when it came down to religious freedom. The federal government wouldn't establish a national church. The states were going to be free uh, to regulate morals with legislation. Uh, there would be state churches up until 1833. Uh, this is a legislative compromise crafted by James Madison and others in the Congress. And actually, if you think about it, it produces a much better result. Uh, then even if you think about what's the major way we defend religious freedom, uh, James, you know, one way you hear a lot of conservatives do James Madison's Memorial of Remonstrance, which I always find that interesting, um, because that conceives of individuals in a very individualistic, mental, idealistic uh, way. Uh, man before God, and it's your opinion that matters. But of course we know religion is something you do corporately with others in a church and in an, in an institution. And that's what's actually being defended in the Bill of Rights, implicitly so. Uh, think about the 14th Amendment. Is the 14th Amendment, uh, was it meant to launch a social revolution, which we've experienced going back for 60 years? Or was it something else? Was it to provide and ensure national rights for newly freed slaves, but not at all intended to really take away self-governing powers from states? And that's largely how it's read now. And that's in many respects one reason for why we're in the fix that we're in, right? why we're getting decisions like Oberger Felby Hodges, Lyon Bosa, and others who don't actually want the states to govern. So it's natural then for those of us who are Bronsonians to favor judicial restraint and to be in favor of a kind of originalism that assumes a presumption of liberty for civic deliberation on issues as diverse as abortion and even entitlements. My libertarian friends will rule entitlements as unconstitutional. That would be a disaster and would lead to complete disrespect for the Constitution if that were to happen, I would argue. So if we think about these, uh, these moments and these decisions, we think about even Obergefell v. Hodges, even with that decision, I would argue there's room to appeal because Obergefell v. Hodges is saying marriage is relational. It's a deeply relational institution. That's Kennedy's uh, conclusion about marriage. And then he links that up to the Constitution and says, and, the, and, the, and no government can deny it. But what's more, so that's why it matters, relation. It's a part of human scholarship. But what's more relational than, than religion, right? What's more developing of our, uh, of our personhood than religion and the opportunity both communing with God and with our fellow believers? And so if, if relational is the key, then of course religious practice should not be burdened by the new understanding of sexuality that is being put into our laws. If religion cannot define public marriage law, which is now the holding, then of course it stands to mind that a public understanding of marriage cannot be used against private religious institutions. We must be free to dissent and to practice as we will, knowing wise men and women do. We want to need us in the future to hold this country together. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you.